2022 for the Housing Authority of the County of Monterey. Um, we'll start with the uh, roll call, please. Chair Wizard. Uh, here. Vice Chair Booter. Here. Commissioner Healy. Present. Commissioner Balaceros. Present. Commissioner Gama. Commissioner Goodwin. Present. We have a quorum. Thank you so much. Um, Vice Chair Booter, could I please ask you to lead us in the pledge this evening? Sure. Hello. Thank I you. Hi, my name is Nancy Lloyd, and I'm the board president of the Monterey County Housing Incorporation, otherwise known as Michi. For years, someone from Michi has reported out on Section 6 reports, but that has since changed. That is why I'm speaking during Section 3, the comments from the public. Michi Hold on just a asked, second. We, we haven't gotten to Section 3 yet. We're still taking care of Section 1 and 2, but uh, very soon we'll open Section 3. We're just going to do the Pledge of Allegiance, then we'll move to comments from the public, and you can um, make your comments then, okay? I, yes. Okay, it'll be just a second longer. Go ahead, uh, Vice Chair Booter. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so much. We'll now move to section three of our agenda, comments from the public. Uh, for anybody wishing to make public comment this evening, Please limit your comments to three minutes and address the board on issues not agendized elsewhere in the agenda. We'll discuss those and offer public comment during those particular items. So this is, uh, again, comments from the public about things that are not already on the agenda this evening. Uh, and if you could uh, either raise your hand or uh, state your name so that we know to call on you and, and give you your, your time. Nancy Lloyd. Okay. Um, Gabriella, do we have anybody besides Nancy, or um, should we proceed? Just want to make sure we're building the queue if there are other speakers as well. I don't see any hands up. Okay, great. Nancy, please go ahead. Okay, hello. Thank you very much. My name is Nancy Lloyd, and I'm the board president of the Monterey County Housing Incorporation, otherwise known as Michi. For years, someone from Michi has reported out on Section 6 reports. But that has changed. That is why I'm speaking now during the comments from the public section three. Michi has asked verbally and in writing for the financials related to the Parkside Casanova transaction since May of 2021. For many years before that, Michi has asked for complete and accurate financials. And as recently as July, Michi has asked for the general ledger. But we have not received the Parkside Casanova transaction financials, nor the general ledger. And what we have received as monthly financials were incomplete and often inaccurate. When we pointed out errors or requested anything, we were ignored. So to the board, the Hackham board, please give Michi direction on who to contact and who will acknowledge us and respond to our request. Michi would really appreciate the Hackam board for their assistance. And thank you for listening to us. Thank you so much, Nancy. I appreciate your comments. Um, I see uh, uh, someone in the meeting under the name username has their hand up. Please go ahead with your comments. Again, three minutes and items not already listed elsewhere on the agenda. Good evening, um, board commissioners and Mr. Gensley. My name is Adriana de los Santos. Um, in listening to the previous public comment, that just um, reminded me of um, some tax forms that I had previously viewed where the Housing Authority, um, Michi was under in the tax form. So I'm wondering, or I'm hoping, or I would urge, I, I should say, I would urge the commissioners to look into that because it 
is Michi a completely different agency or why is it that we, the housing authority, um, they would be part of the tax return? Um, I'm, perhaps it's just me, I don't understand. Um, so that's it. Thank you very much for your time and um, yeah. Thank you for your comments. Is there anyone else wishing to make public comment this evening? Um, if so, please indicate uh, you would like to by raising your hand or uh, announcing your name so we can call on you. Okay, hearing and seeing no one else, uh, I will close public comment and ask that uh, Tori, if he is able to rep uh, respond at all, uh, even if it's just to acknowledge those speakers. Uh, and I would say uh, from the board that we do hear comments uh, from Michi under item six, uh, but that has been uh, typically, as far as I can remember in my re relatively limited time on the board, uh, has been our representative, um, uh, usually uh, Director Miller, um, who is no longer with us uh, on the board, has made a, a report and I know um, Director Ballesteros and now Director Goodwin have been making reports um, as our uh, designees to the Michi board. Uh, but uh, Tori, if you have any, um, if you're able to comment at all on any of the other uh, items that were raised. Um, so we're well aware of the desire for the general ledger. Um, what we are trying to focus on right now is the priority of getting the audits done. Um, and Michi needs their audit done. We need the Michi audit done to be able to complete our audits. Uh, and so that has been the priority project right now is, is getting those audits complete. Um, and that's, that's what's had to take priority. Um, we do respond uh, when there are questions um, and have tried to answer them. But, uh, you know, I think Michi and Hackham can sit down and, and we can dialogue um, about what it is you're looking for and what the concern is, but turning over the entire general ledger um, to have you go through and question it all and send many questions and comments uh, takes away the time that we need right now to work on the audit. And so that's, that's what we believe the priority is, is getting the audits done. And the auditors do look at all of the numbers. Um, and the, the most recent Michi audit uh, didn't reveal any problems. Um, so I, I think that's, that's where our position is right now. Okay, great. And then I saw, um, or rather I heard uh, another comment asking about the relationship between Michi and, and Hackam. I don't know if that's something you're prepared to uh, say a sentence or two about. So Michi was created by the Housing Authority. They are listed as a part of uh, our audit. Uh, they also have their own separate audit. Um, so it is uh, not an entity that is controlled by the Housing Authority, but it is a related entity to the Housing Authority. Okay, thank you so much, Tori, I appreciate it. Um, we will now uh, transition to item four, presentations. Um, there is a recognition of service to Manny Longoria for 25 long or short years, depending on your perspective, uh, years of service to the Housing Authority. Yeah, right. so we are pleased to present this certificate of service to Manny. Um, I did not, I don't see his name listed, but he might be on one of the phone numbers. Uh, Manny, if you're on. Um, Congratulations, and, and you can feel free to say a few words. I think he's, he's not on, but we'll make sure to get him the certificate uh, tomorrow. Wonderful. Well, of course, um, uh, I'll just take the prerogative to thank him on behalf of the board. Um, you know, we are just incredibly grateful and indebted to our uh, dedicated employees who spend so much time and, and so much of their energy furthering the mission of providing safe, decent, and affordable housing to households all across uh, Monterey and parts of San Luis Obispo County. Uh, and we couldn't do it without, without their dedication. So thank you very much, Manny, and, and we appreciate all you've done. Uh, moving now to item five, our consent agenda. 
we have three items. Uh, one, item A, Resolution 3064, uh, Assembly Bill 361. It is um, the mechanism by which we continue to meet virtually so long as the uh, proclamation from the governor's office remains in effect, uh, allowing us to do so. Uh, item 5B is minutes from our May 23rd, 2022 board meeting. And item 5C is minutes from our July 25th, 2022 regular board meeting. Uh, so we will consider all these items together with one motion unless a member of the board or a member of the public wishes to pull that item for discussion. Is there any member of the board who wishes to pull item 5A, 5B, or 5C for discussion? Hearing and seeing none, we'll move to the public. Any members of the public wish to pull item 5A, 5B, or 5C for further discussion? Seeing no hands and hearing no speakers, uh, we will return to the board for action. I make a motion to approve. I second that. Uh, it's been properly moved by Commissioner Ballesteros and seconded by Vice Chair Booter that we adopt the consent agenda, items 5A, 5B, and 5C. Uh, is there any uh, discussion on the motion? Hearing and seeing none, I will move to the public. Any public comment on the motion to approve items 5A, 5B, or 5C on the consent agenda this evening? Again, hearing and seeing no one, we will close public comment, return to the vote, excuse me, the board for a roll call vote. Commissioner Wizard. Aye. Commissioner Booter. Yes. Commissioner Healy. Aye. Commissioner Ballesteros. Yes. Commissioner Gama. Yes. Commissioner Goodwin. Yes. Motion carries. Thank you so much, Tori. We'll now move to item six on the agenda, reports of committees. Uh, Commissioner Ballesteros, do you have a report from personnel committee? Um, yes, um, I believe that the information is under new business. And I also wanted to ask Tori to on the if he can mention on the human resources report and update on the executive director position and how we're preparing. Um, if he could just make a report at that time when we, when it comes up on the agenda of the, um, you know, how we're preparing for, uh, for to um, prepare in the interviews, I'm sorry, to prepare in the interviews for the executive director position. So that's it, but we did meet. Wonderful, thank you so much, uh, Commissioner Ballesteros and Tori will, uh... We'll pick that up. Uh, actually, let me ask you, do you think that's more appropriate to respond to now um, in a brief overview, or do you want to uh, do that later in the agenda? Uh, either way is fine. All right, let's, since these are reports and we have the opportunity to have a little bit more dialogue in the business items, we'll hold that uh, response for now. Um, the Finance and Development Committee, Commissioner Gama, do you have any reports? Uh, no, we did not meet this month. Okay, very good, thank you so much. Uh, Commissioner Goodwin um, from the Monterey County Housing uh, Incorporated, Monterey County Housing Incorporated and the uh, Affordable Acquisitions. Any reports from those meetings? Um, from Michi, um, we met on um, July 26 at 6 p.m. And um, there was a, a closed session regarding the elevator that was not working in the Parkside um, uh, complex. Um, and uh, and uh, John Rose came up with a um, a viable solution to um, have an. I have to interrupt. And I have to interrupt because this was discussed in the closed session. Oh, sorry. Okay, I apologize. Okay, um, then I I don't really have anything to report. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. Um. Uh, we'll move to number seven, the report of the secretary. 
Um, Tori, go ahead. So uh, I spent a lot of time this month working on the housing choice voucher utilization plan, and we have a new business item that uh, will go into that in some detail. Uh, at the end of last month, uh, we had an employee recognition uh, event at Toro Park that went very well. Uh, folks had a good time um, and uh, attended a number of other meetings uh, in the community. Uh, the Chispa Housing Pipeline, the Monterey County Children's Council, the Chispa Board Meeting. Uh, I was asked to, to speak uh, at the Home Collaborative Meeting. Um, and I also uh, was asked to provide an update uh, to the county's ad hoc committee. Um, so that was kind of the, the basis of uh, a, a lot of the activity that went on this month. Um, and I, I also uh, talked with our recruiter for the executive director. Um, we have uh, several candidates uh, that we should be getting a packet uh, this week. Um, and we are hoping to interview them uh, by the end of the month. Um, and they are just, uh, there are some people who are firmly in and there are some people who are on the fence and she had uh, given them a deadline of kind of saying, are you in or are you out before she forwards the packet? Uh, so that's kind of what we're waiting on. Great. And I just wanted to double check. Um, was it your understanding that uh, Commissioner Gama's, excuse me, Commissioner Biasteros's comments were going to be addressed in the new business under the new payment standards for HCV, or is it more appropriate to discuss them now? Um, her comments around the executive director, I, I think we could address them now um, if there were other questions about the, the process. Yeah, Commissioner Ballesteros, I just wanted to double check that your question was going to get answered because I, I thought it lined up better with what Tori had just said versus what looks to be agendized for uh, our new business. Okay, so I think my concern was that because we want to move forward in getting that position filled because to me, currently, I feel it's vital. And I did, be, I believe I asked that part of the ad hoc committee, I did receive an email from Tori and I responded uh, back to him saying I'm available in case they have any interviews scheduled for the end of August. And um, what I just want to address is that it's very important and critical that we get that position filled, especially because we want to make sure that the agency is running smoothly and that we're uniting the staff, the team members that do that, that handle the daily uh, duties in the agency and especially too because we have received additional vouchers and thank you Tori for um, getting that accomplished in, in you know what you accomplished in doing that and um, I just want to you know that's one of my priorities and I believe it's all of our prior our priority is to get that position filled and that way we can move forward and um, you know um, completing our mission to this community. So that was it. Thank Great. you. Thank uh, you. Professor. Yeah, of course. And thank you for sharing those. I, um, you know, for the benefit of the public, we're, we're aiming to do some interviews here at the end of this month, as Commissioner Ballesteros said, um, you know, early, early next week. Um, and hopefully we're able to make some progress and uh, advance our search uh, and get a, a new executive director under contract uh, and for those that don't have the backstory, uh, uh, Tori has been with us for a while now and is a, a contract uh, executive director helping us out in while we search for a new permanent one. And uh, you know, eventually his contract will end and we wanna make sure that we have somebody in place before that happens. So um, you know, we were always envisioning that Tori would leave us uh, sooner than later. And we continue to you know, search for um, uh, Jose's replacement, Jose's uh, successor, uh, and Tori was uh, helping us uh, along the way. So uh, we hope to continue to make developments and, and share soon that we have found uh, someone to replace uh, or, or rather fill the very big shoes left by, by Jose, uh, Jose's departure. Um, thank you for your report, Tori. We'll move now to item eight, uh, resolution 3065. 
uh, establishing a new payment standard for the HCV program. Tori. And Gabby, if you can go to the financial impact on page 17, um, I, I wanna give you a little bit of context, uh, commissioners. Um, and I think that the, the finances is the, the best place to start. So currently, if Hackam didn't make any changes to the way that we operate and to our payment standards, we would be expected to have a little over $7 million of HAP reserves. HAP reserves can only be spent on housing assistance payments. Um, and that would put us uh, over the maximum reserve level uh, by $1.8 million that would be considered excess reserves and subject to an offset from HUD. Uh, and I've been hearing a lot that an offset is very possible this coming year. Um, sometimes there's no offset and sometimes there is. Um, and if we implement the payment standard increase recommended in this memo, um, the reserve re level would re be reduced to just under $6 million with zero excess HAP dollars subject to an offset. Um, if we do a more aggressive implementation, which would allow landlords to request a rent increase, um, if they had not already requested a rent increase, it would potentially reduce um, the reserves to 5.4 million um, and set up the housing authority uh, for better future HAP renewals. Um, and to explain a little bit about how HUD funds the, the HAP. So every dollar that we spend during January to December that is authorized, um, you get the following year plus an inflation factor. Um, so we don't get 100% necessarily. If you only spend 98%, you get 98% plus an inflation factor. Um, and uh, if we don't take any steps, we are looking at having a budget offset, which would actually mean that we would see our funding decrease this year from $50.3 million to $48.5 million. Um, and that's assuming no FMR increase. And I'll get to that in a, in a minute. Scenario two, where we implement the higher payment standards and the voucher issuance would result in an increase to $51 million. And then the most aggressive course of action, uh, Gabby, if you can scroll down to the next paragraph, um, that would increase uh, us to $51.5 million in 2023 and another $2 million increase in 2024 uh, on top of what we would get in the second scenario. Um, so what this memo is asking for is uh, two things. One, uh, to authorize a payment standard increase. And then two, guidance on really whether to implement scenario two or scenario three. Um, and we can do either scenario both scenarios fix the immediate problem of excess reserves um, and uh, the utilization. Um, scenario three, in my opinion, sets us up uh, for even better funding in the future. Um, and now if we can scroll back to the, the first page, um, so why are we doing this? We're doing this for two main reasons. One is the financial reasons, which I've just explained. Um, the other is to respond to the market and help our voucher holders be more successful um, in finding places to rent. Um, so we did a rent study. Uh, we found a 31% increase. Um, other Factors out there have seen a 29% increase. Um, when you look at the, the rental market in Monterey, um, and we believe that our funding in 2023 is going to go up substantially,
because of our market study and which is derived from the real increase in rent that all renters are paying. Um, and so we're looking at having a big increase. Um, and so uh, we had proactively asked for waivers earlier in the year, uh, which would allow us to implement this uh, quickly. Um, one of the things, uh, and if you can go to the next page, Gabby, um, one of the things that it would let us do um, is immediately in September, lower the tenant portion for 618 households. So right now in the voucher program, we have 618 households who are paying more than 30% of their monthly adjusted income for rent. Um, and the baseline, you know, normally you pay 30% of your rent. And it is really when you are going above our authorized payment standards that the tenant takes on that additional burden and says, hey, you know, I'd like to stay in my apartment, but your payment standard is 2000 a month and my landlord increased my rent to 2100 this year. So I'm gonna pay that extra hundred out of my own pocket in addition to the 30% that I already pay. Um, and that's you know, one indication that you've got a rapidly increasing market. Um, so increasing the payment standards will immediately impact these 618 households. Um, and it will immediately help us uh, with the excess reserves. Um, the other option is to allow landlords, and this is scenario three, to allow landlords who did not ask for a rent increase in this past year, um, a one-time opportunity to ask for a rent increase, understanding that there are new payment standards out there. And we think um, that this will, A, help keep tenants in place longer, um, and B, it will also help us with the excess reserves. Um, the other piece of the equation is increasing voucher issuance. Um, and this is something that is more informative. I'm not asking the board for permission. This is sort of the normal thing that we do is manage the size of the voucher program and, and how we issue vouchers. Um, so uh, we sat down and, and did a bunch of analysis um, and we are hoping to issue 50 vouchers in August and 50 vouchers in September. Um, and we think that the timing of having new payment standards in place will help these tenants be more successful uh, than tenants in the past have been with being able to find a unit uh, that will accept the voucher and that can pay for the unit. Um, so if we are successful in these things, uh, the higher payment standards um, will help tenants it will help staff because there will be less work involved in reissuing vouchers all the time to people who aren't successful and extending vouchers. Um, it would reduce our HAP reserves. And by increasing the number of vouchers that we are circulating, uh, that also generates additional administrative fee, um, which helps pay for the program. Um, so I'm happy to answer questions um, and would love thoughts on whether I should go with scenario two or scenario three um, as we move forward. Thanks very much, Tori. And uh, just to record it uh, on the video in case somebody doesn't have access uh, and can only listen, can you uh, state again that the numbers involved uh, with scenarios one, two, and three? Well, scenario one is really uh, not an option. So scenario one would leave us with excess reserves of $1.8 million. Um, and scenario two, uh, we would have zero excess HAP um, and reserves of about $5.9 million. Scenario three um, has us at $5.5 million reserve and zero excess HAP. The other thing that 
uh, scenario three would do is it would get our utilization rate uh, very close to the maximum number of points on CMAP. Um, and it would put us into a higher category than scenario two for the CMAP, which is the section eight management assessment protocol. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Questions from commissioners? Mr. Vice Chair, I see that you're unmuted if you'd like to lead us off. Yeah, no, Tori, so on scenario three, I just wanna make sure I'm understanding. These are landlords who did not request an increase. Is the idea that they were presumably up against the payment standard and the maximum rent to owner and so? They, they just figured there was no, they, they, the only reason they wouldn't ask for an increase is because they knew it would be coming out of the, the family's pocket. And so they were like, eh, we'll, we'll let it slide. Got it. Okay. Yeah. And I guess, okay. I have another question that I can defer because I don't think it's, it's as um, important to this. I just have a question about how this will roll out over time, but um, <clears throat> this would apply to people who like within the past year have um, like signed a new lease and the landlord did not request a rent increase. That's, that's, yeah, so uh, I think the way that we've written it up is it would have to be somebody that had been continuously on the program for over a year yeah. um, and, and did not ask for a rent increase. Okay. Any other questions from commissioners? Well, I'll ask Tori, uh, what would be, uh, I understood you to say that option one is not really an option because it ends up creating a likelihood of a financial penalty for us and that does not further our mission. So it doesn't make sense to me to uh, you know, flirt with a decrease in revenue and a potential inability to provide the same level of service we're providing today. Um, so I'm not necessarily in favor of that option. But for options two and three, you know, one you characterized as more aggressive than the other. Um, and I, uh, I'm understanding that the more aggressive of the two options is not aggressive in terms of riskiness, but aggressive in terms of, um, you know, what, you know, the, the breadth of the potential change, you know, how many households, as opposed to a, a narrower, more conservative approach, which gets us under that threshold for you know, having the feds take some of the cash back, but isn't as much as we might otherwise do. Is that a fair characterization? Yeah, well, so I think the, the other question is what's the, what's the downside or the risk with number three? And so the, the risk with number three is if we don't have um, a bigger increase than just kind of normal inflation, um, we might find ourselves uh, running very close to no reserves. Um, and so it's, it's saying, we really believe due to all the market activity that the FMRs are going to go up substantially and that rather than a 2% increase or a 3% increase, we might be looking at a 10, 20, 30% increase. Um, and that's, that's the risk. Uh, the modeling that I've done um, in scenario three shows that we, even with the more aggressive one, we would still have enough money um, to make it through the year um, without problems, um, but it would be much tighter than uh, scenario two. So just to repeat that back to make sure I'm understanding it, the potential risk, uh, you know, sort of a worst case yep. scenario is that we go with the most aggressive number three, you know, and, and increase um, the, the value of the housing voucher for more households and that the projected increase in revenue from the federal government to cover this program as they already do, doesn't match what we thought it would happen and so we cover, we, out of the money we've got, have to cover the difference. Correct. 
and how long might that situation play out? I mean, is this a, yeah. you know, before we catch up, is that three years? Is it 30 years? You know, would we spend down all of our reserves? Would we go into the red? Would it just be a little hit? Like what's the. So um, the, the modeling shows that we can cover 2023. It's 2024. That would be a problem if the FMRs didn't get a bump um, beyond the normal two or 3% bumps that, we're used to seeing. Um, but the other piece is uh, Maria and I um, have been working a lot on uh, the two-year tool, which is a more sophisticated modeling tool. And so what the more aggressive position would require is that we more closely monitor um, our utilization and the model on a monthly basis as we make decisions about further voucher issuance or whether to pull back on voucher issuance. Um, and I think that, you know, the, the truth of the matter is we should be doing that anyways uh, and, and watching uh, this program month to month. Um, it just in scenario three, uh, it becomes more critical that we pay close attention to what's going on with the program. Okay, great. Thank you so much. We'll go out to the public now uh, for questions and comments from them. Uh, any members of the public wishing to comment on this? Actually, Chair or Vice Chair Booter, do you have another question or was that a comment? Yeah, I had a question. Uh, sure. Tori, what is the, um, what is what do you have in as an assumption in your model for an increase uh, to the FMR as relative to the um, so HUD yeah. puts in a two and a half percent increase, which I think is absurdly low. And what do you have? Is that, you know, these numbers um, that we're the, looking at in this memo, are you assuming that that's the increase or are you assuming? Yeah, that's so that's, we're, we're using HUD's uh, two and a half percent that that's the inflation that we see. Um, we really think that with a rent study that shows a 31% increase, um, we're going to get a much bigger increase than two and a half percent. Got it. So these numbers assume the two and a half percent. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, uh, Vice Chair Butter. Anybody from the public wishing to ask questions or make comments? Uh, now's your time. Please limit your questions and comments to three minutes uh, on the topic of uh, changes to the housing authorities uh, payment standards for the housing choice voucher program. Uh, please raise your hand or announce yourself so that we can call on you. Gabby, you don't have anybody on the phone? I do not. Okay. Well, hearing and seeing no one wishing to comment or ask questions on this item, we'll close public comment and return to the board. Are there any comments from board commissioners about the proposed change uh, for establishing new payment standards in the Housing Choice Voucher Program? I mean, I think it's gonna be huge to give folks the purchasing power that they actually need to be able to find housing here. You know, our success rate, um, uh, it's not terrible compared to some other housing authorities, but still in, you know, on absolute terms, uh, it's still not great. And there's a lot of people that cycle out of the program because they just can't find a place um, where they can use their voucher. So I think that piece of it is, um, is huge. Um, and it, you know, just so happens that it dovetails with, uh, setting us up for, you know, better scores, uh, with, with HUD, it sets us up to, you know, get in a virtuous cycle of higher subsidies or higher, um, higher funding from HUD. So I think that, you know, makes, uh, makes total sense. Um, so I appreciate all the hard work that went into it. Great, thank you. I'm not seeing any other uh, commissioners wishing to make comments. Is there a motion 
And can we clarify if the motion is for scenario two or scenario three? Yes, I will ensure that that is explicitly clear for the record. Um, Chair Wizard, with that as a backdrop, I, I would definitely agree with Vice Chair Booter's comments um, you know, as it relates to increasing the purchasing power. I think my tendency is probably to, to move toward the more conservative approach. I'm sure that Tory's estimates are in line, and I think we would all anticipate those large scale increases, but I think my gut tells me from a fiduciary responsibility perspective, it's probably more prudent for the agency to take the more conservative approach as opposed to overshooting the potential estimates and leaving ourselves without a reserve and putting ourselves in a potentially precarious financial situation in 2024, if I'm hearing the information correctly. So I would support definitely increasing the payment standard, but I would tend to be more so on the uh, option two, scenario two conservative side. That's good comments. Thank you so much. Um, I guess I would ask just a, a quick interlude to Tori. Um, help us better understand the administrative piece of this. Is this something that a housing authority can do uh, once a calendar year, once a fiscal year, once some other interval of time as often as they'd like? How does this work? So the the board and the housing authority can change payment standards as often as they want to. Um, there's no, no restriction on that. Uh, the ability to do the one-time um, immediate implementation uh, for the rent burdened households or landlords uh, was a special waiver because Monterey, like much of the rest of the county had been experiencing rapidly increasing rents and so HUD said, we're gonna create some tools for people to try to help address that. Um, so normally when you change payment standards, um, they become effective. Um, when they become effective, they become effective immediately for the people who are looking for a house um, and then at least renewal. Um, and so normally you, you don't have this one-time ability to go help out the tenants that, that are rent burdened and you don't have the ability to, to offer landlords kind of a one-time chance to ask for a rent increase. Okay, so is under either scenario, do we achieve that or is that only achieved in one of the scenarios? Uh, in both scenarios, we're taking advantage of uh, HUD waivers. Um, the scenario three, the more aggressive scenario, takes fuller advantage of the waivers that we've been given. Okay. But sorry, Chair, um, but Tori, in both scenarios, <clears throat> the rent burdened households are taken care of. Got it. Yep. Yep. Okay. Okay. So, uh, I don't know if you have already done this work or if you could, you know, in, in broad strokes uh, estimate this, but if we were to pursue a more conservative approach and pursue option two, do you have a sense of when it would be appropriate to say, you know, should we consider now going to option three or scenario three? And, and if so, is that just when we get the next year's numbers or is there a different way to think about this? Um, so if we did option two, um, the, the, I would have to look at the HUD waivers because the HUD waivers said we could make a one-time change um, in the middle of the year. Um, and if we did three, we're making a one-time change for two groups of people. Um, if we did two, we, I would have to double check to see whether or not we would be able to then implement option three at a later point. Um, we certainly would be able to implement option three um, when we got the new funding and put out a new payment standard. Um, but at, at that point, really, you, you wouldn't normally do kind of the one-time injection. So the one-time injection for us is right now we're in August. 
we get graded on our utilization for January to December. Um, and so changes that you make in December, it's really too late to have any impact on the overall utilization levels. And really you're looking at those changes then impact 2023. So the any changes that you wanna make in 2022 that will have enough impact um, to make a change in your 2023 need to happen now. Um, it's not to say that you still couldn't do it. It just, it, it, every month that you don't do it, it has less and less impact. Sure. And, and so just as a final question, does it, is it right to think of it that, well, maybe not the most elegant, um, but for you know, valid reasons, we could do two and then after some time do three, but it would be, uh, it would not be possible to do three and then go back to number two. Right, because three includes number two. Right, okay. I just um, want to make sure that was clear. Uh, that was how I understood it, but I want to make sure yeah. that we were you know, all on the sh same sheet of music. So um, I would love to hear some more questions or comments from commissioners. Um, I, I heard Commissioner Healy um, say a preference, and I uh, res totally respect that. I just I, I didn't quite hear it phrased in terms of a motion. If you're ready to do that, by all means, uh, I'd be happy to accept your motion. I have a question. Have, oh, go ahead, Commissioner. Um, uh, the, as far as the voucher distri distribution, um, it inc it would include like um, housing authority uh, apartments as well. I mean, properties as well. Correct. Uh, no. So the the housing authority properties are um, under the RAD program. Uh, and it has a different set of rules. So it doesn't change the, the RAD rents. Um, if the housing authority owned true market rate that, that had uh, was not RAD, um, it, could, it could impact those rents. Um, and so, you know, if, if we had voucher holders uh, at Tynan, a tax credit property, um, Tynan would be, it could impact Tynan and they, they could ask for a rent increase. Okay. Um, do you have an opinion um, personally of which way would be the, the better way to go? So with your expertise? Yeah, I think it really depends on the, the goals of the agency and, and what's acceptable for the board. So I personally, I always like to be a, a high performer uh, and I don't like to leave any money on the table. I like to spend as much money as I can and, and run it as close to the wire to serve as many people as possible. Um, but uh, that strategy um, does come with the risk that if you run too close to the wire, you can wind up in shortfall. Um, and now the, not secret, but the, the trick is if you wind up in shortfall, sometimes if you do the things that HUD asks, which may be painful, like rolling back payment standards for a period of time, you'll get extra funding. Um, but I, I've always operated under the, I wanna try to maximize the, the funding that the housing authority receives to, to be able to serve more people. Um, scenario two uh, probably puts, um, uh, high performer might may, may be out of reach this year um, and it would be a standard performer. Um, uh, some of that will depend on how quickly the 100 households are issued vouchers and how quickly they lease up. Um, so I, so my, my, my preference, if, if I were a commissioner, I would be in favor of three, um, but I also completely understand scenario two being a good option as well. Chair Wizard, if there are no other questions or comments, I'd be happy to offer my motion. Please go ahead. Uh, I would move approval of resolution 3065, uh, utilizing scenario two as described by the executive director. All right, we have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? I'll 
I'll do, I'll make a motion for to second it. Okay, it's been properly moved by Commissioner Healy and seconded by Commissioner Ballesteros that the Housing Authority adopt uh, item 8A resolution 3065 establishing new payment standards for the HCV program uh, and pursuing scenario number two as described in the staff report. Is there any discussion on the motion? Hearing no one is seeing no hands. Oh, go ahead, Commissioner. No, John, I was just, I was just going to say I th I think um, you know I, I see I see the argument for for number three and you know trying to get to the high performer status and also trying to again create that virtuous cycle. Um, at the same time, there is a lot of like real change here happening, and you know we are adjusting the payment standards and it'll be interesting to see what tenant behavior looks like in terms of where people are using those vouchers. And so I think there also is, you know, maybe some argument for um, conservatism there. Um, it sounds like the, the sense of the board here is going to be towards conservatism. And I think it, you know, I think it makes sense. Um, you know, the other piece is, I think it would be great to at some point have Tori as a consultant to help us work on this stuff. But the other thing in the back of my mind is, um, you know, to get so close to the wire, like we we won't have Tori forever. Um, and I, if Tori was going to be here forever, I think I would feel very comfortable getting, you know, close to that line. Um, but without that being the case, I think maybe maybe the more conservative option makes some sense. So. Yeah, thank you very much for those comments, Commissioner Ryan. I think that um, you encapsulated some of the hesitation I had at you know knowing that you know Tori was going to be here start to finish uh, to ensure sort of a steady hand and and how to minimize any negative consequence should there be one. It would give me the utmost confidence, but you know that there could be some transition and and it maybe doesn't work out exactly as we thought. You know, we can't go wrong with number two. Uh, we might go wrong with number three, and so uh, I appreciate uh, um, I appreciate the concerns uh, espoused and you know, shared by uh, you and Commissioner Healy. So, with that, uh, I'll ask for a roll call vote, please, on adopting resolution thirty sixty five, uh, approving the new payment standards and pursuing scenario two. Commissioner Wizard, aye. Commissioner Booter, yes. Commissioner Healy, aye. Commissioner Ballesteros. Yes. Commissioner Gama. Yes. Commissioner Goodwin. Yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much and uh, very, very good discussion. I appreciate everyone's questions and, and comments, um, you know, the important stuff. And I wanna make sure that, you know, I, rather I wanna acknowledge that we really, uh, you know, took seriously these uh, weighty questions and, you know, uh, uh, trying to advance the, the housing authority and, and expand our mission, or rather expand the number of households we can serve through our mission. Um, we'll move now to item nine, the information items. Just in the interest of time, since we're about to hit an hour, um, I would like to ask those making reports to uh, you know, try to pursue a little bit more succinct report, if, if at all possible. And we'll start with 9A, the human resource report. Tori, is that you today? That's me. Uh, so the the big update is um, Tamberlin Creighton, the HR director, has been let go. Um, in addition to that, we still are looking for uh, a number of positions, uh, including director of finance and director of property management. Um, and uh, we have brought back uh, James Menard Cabrera, um, who is uh, holding things together in HR right now. And so those those are the big updates. Thank you very much. I, item 9B, the finance report. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Um, um, I just wanted to let you know that the audit for 2019 is in draft and we should have a final hopefully by next week. And then we'll be starting on the 2020 and our goal is to have all of the Hackam audits completed by the end of the year. And um, 
we'll, we should be working on the budget as soon as this audit is done. That's our next project. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you so much. Item 9C, the development of property management reports, Carolina and Jose. Um, let's see, the only thing I'll add to my report is on uh, Tynan Village, the painters are, the stucco company and the painters are going full force on the last building. Uh, we hope to be finally done with that by the end of September. And then Parkside, you know, our team and, and Jose's team are, are meeting weekly to have files ready for lease up whenever we get those buildings turned. Uh, PG&E is still a bit of a delay along with Comcast, but one of the buildings, um, it looks like we might go back to having one building at a time released. It all depends on PG&E. But right now, building B is ready for final punch walk once it's energized and the same with the community center building. Great. Thanks for that update. Uh, Jose, are you on the call this evening? Oh. Chair Wizard, I have a question in regards to the development report. Sure, go ahead. Um, I noticed under, um, I believe it's Parkside, there's something that's typed in there. I'm trying to look for it. Um, it I'm gonna go to it to see if I could find it. Um, it says, um, under Parkside, it's page um, 41, but mm -hmm. on the second, the second bullet, it says HDC does not have site control, and that's phase two, and it says the remainder Mitchie property. So what is, I just wanted to get an explanation. What does that mean? So that means at this time, we, we can't start the development. I believe I brought this up back in maybe February, March, when we had the opportunity to apply for the next round of tax credits. Uh -huh. But without, without HDC owning the property, we're not able to apply for funding. So the, the remainder of Parkside is still owned by Nietzsche at this time. And we haven't entered into a development agreement with them yet. Okay. So All we're right. Yeah, we're unable to move forward. Okay. Thank you. And then to, uh, I'm sorry, uh, to add to uh, Carolina's um, uh, question, I mean, uh, report, uh, uh -huh. we have been uh, completing, uh, I mean, uh, orientations, bulk orientations uh, at uh, one of our uh, sites. And we've been bringing in uh, people to evaluate them for park site one. The process is going. Uh, we have several uh, people that are interested and we're evaluating them. We're work working with Maria's team on that process and we anticipate to have um, the files ready for a lease up when we get the building for one park site. We also completed uh, today the inspection for Portola Vista and everything went well. We didn't have any major findings or issues. Um, we completed the REAC, I mean the CREA inspection for Hacienda 3 and the um, inspection for uh, Hacienda Senior. And we also got a, the closeout letter for uh, 803, Isalina's family RAD. We finally got that closeout letter for the audit. So we're happy that we got that. And that's all I have. Thanks very much. Um, and then our last report, uh, item, item 9D, the housing programs, Maria. Um, yes, good evening. Um, um, the only thing I need to add to the board among my board report is to give you a highlight. Um, my staff and I, we worked on Friday and Saturday. Um, like Tori mentioned, we need to issue vouchers. Um, we went ahead and we sent out 700 appointment letters. And out of the 700, only 288 families showed up for the appointment to review if they qualified for a preference. So we actually scheduled 230 families and um, 58 did not qualify. So the remaining, the 412 families did not show up, which we're gonna probably send out another preference letter to verify whether or not they should still retain that preference in order to qualify. So even if we schedule the 230 families, doesn't mean that they may qualify because we did see a lot of families um, 
that um, don't have legal status or, um, you know, they may be denied due to, you know, in being over income or if they're um, criminal background. So sometimes with my staff, we have to do like three, three to one or four to one just to get, um, you know, families eligible to get their voucher. So my staff is working so hard. I mean, I just want to give them kudos for um, for, for us scheduling all those people was over 200, almost close to 300 families we saw on Friday and Saturday, just to get them in. Um, so we could try to bring up our utilization and hopefully families do find housing because we did a lot of the families did mention you know it's great that they may get the voucher but the big problem is that there's not enough units out there for them and um, you know we do know the concern you know we hear their concerns um, but we're hoping um, you know with the the payment standards going up a little bit higher but the main main concern is there's not enough housing units out there so I just wanted to let the board know that, you know, we did do a big, big orientation for families to come in. Great, thank you. And I'm glad to hear that so many people um, were interviewed and, and that we're really making progress. Uh, I appreciate that report, Maria. Thank you so um, much. So we heard our information items uh, in record time and I would like to encourage the commissioners in their comments to, um, if they're able, be just as succinct. Um, we can go through each commissioner or you can just offer your comments if you would so like. Oh, I would just say great job putting in the work on a on a Saturday and getting through that many families is, you know, is not easy. So um, I think great job by the uh, voucher team. Thank you. I want to say congrats to Manny Longoria for 25 years of dedication in serving our community of Monterey County and the other counties also. And also thank you to the staff and Maria for the work done in serving the families those days. I, I It probably was a lot of overwhelming work involved, so thank you. Yes, that was. Thank you. Commissioner Gillen, I saw that you unmuted for a second. I don't know if you wanted to say something. I was just about to close us out if you didn't have any comments. All right, well, thank you very much everyone. And again, um, to Maria and her team, you know, working extra on the weekend is uh, certainly uh, incredible effort and we're very uh, excited about all of the good work that you're doing and, and the opportunity to expand the number of, of households that we're serving. So, you know, uh, kudos to you and your team and um, uh, thank you everyone for giving us a few extra minutes here and going over the hour and uh, there being no further business, this meeting is adjourned. And then Gabby or Tori, I don't know if we're going to take a break before we transition to HDC meeting, or if we're just going to get straight into it. But uh, I know I'll leave that question, or the resolution there to uh, Kathleen. I just uh, don't know how if there was any plan. I believe maybe we could just take a few minute break in case somebody needs to use the restroom. Open up the meeting. Okay, thank you. I'm going to open up the meeting. I believe it's six oh eight nine. 609. So go ahead, Tori, to take roll call. Uh, Director Ballesteros. Present. Director Miller. D oh, Director Booter. Present. Director Gama. Present. Director Goodwin. Present. Director Healy. Present. Director Wizard. Here. You have a quorum. Thank you. So we'll go to item number three, comments from the public. Is there anybody in the public we, uh, wishing to address the, uh, the board?
No one has their hands up. Okay. Thank you, Gabby. So now to item number four, consent agenda. And it is uh, 4A minutes approval of the minutes of the HTC regular board meeting held on July 25th, 2022. 4B minutes approval of minutes of the HTC special board meeting held on July 27th, 2022. And then item 4C memorandum resolution MDC 211, which is the AB361. So do I have um, any questions regarding those um, items that I mentioned? Is there any comments from the public regarding those items? I hear none. So um, do I have a motion on the, on the floor to, for approval? I move approval of consent agenda items for A, B, and C. Thank you. Do I, I have a that. pardon? I second that. Okay, thank you. So that was Director Wizard and then um, Director Buter. Uh, roll call, please. Director Ballesteros. Yes. Director Buter. Yes. Director Gama. Yes. Director Goodwin. Yes. Director Healy. Yes. Director Wizard. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. So now we'll go to um, new business. Um, number 5A, Memorandum Resolution, MDC 212, approval of the procurement policy. And Tori, go ahead. So the HDC procurement policy was based on the, the outdated HACM policy, which has since been updated. Uh, this has a few changes and I've outlined where those changes are. Um, in purchasing methods, there's a new uh, developer services section um, and there's also a design build section. Uh, and we expanded the multi-step bids, one of the things that you would often want to be able to do with developers is a multi-step process where first you put out an RFP and you request um, you know, an RFQ, you put on an RFQ to just kind of say, hey, developers, tell us why you're great. Um, and then you might select two that you feel are exceptionally great that you would then ask them for a proposal. Uh, and so that's the multi-step bid process. Um, and then we also expanded the contractor responsibilities uh, and tightened that up uh, a little bit more. And then throughout the, throughout the document, we changed HACM to HTC and housing authority to agency and commissioners to directors, et cetera. Um, but other than that, it should look like a very familiar document. And I'm happy to answer questions. Are there any questions? Go ahead. Yeah, Tori, is there anything, um, is there anything that is sort of housing authority specific that, um, you know, is maybe more restrictive? Um, obviously restrictive also means, um, you know, prudent sometimes, but is there anything that's sort of excessively restrictive that maybe we don't want to tie ourselves to? So um, in both the HACM policy and the HDC policy, uh, we used language that says when those restrictive things apply, then it applies. Um, because HACM itself uh, freed itself of a lot of those regulations when it exited the public housing program. Mm -hmm. um, so both of the documents have a lot of uh, some of those old requirements in there, but the language was changed to if section three applies, if Davis-Bacon applies, then it shall be followed this way. Okay. Any other questions for Tori?
Hearing none, uh, do I have a motion for this um, resolution? Move approval. Thank you. Do I have a second? I second that. Okay, so I have Director Wizard and Director Buter that second. Uh, roll call, please. Director Ballesteros. Yes. Director Buter. Yes. Director Gama. Yes. Director Goodwin. Yes. Director Healy. Yes. Director Wizard. Motion carries. Thank you. So we already on number six A, we already had done the development and property management report in the previous HACA meeting. So I'll go ahead and we'll go to seven A, B, and C, and D, the closed session. And um, there's the existing litigation for uh, Zamwa construction versus Haciendas three. B is the existing litigation of Zumwalt Construction Incorporated versus Castorville FLC LP. And then C is existing litigation Hacendia Senior LP versus Zumwalt Construction Incorporated. And finally, D is anticipated litigation, and that's pursuant to government code section 54956.9D2. So um, I okay, so we're opening, uh, we're coming out from closed session and the time is 6.27 p.m. And go ahead, Tori. Uh, so the last item uh, on the agenda is the settlement agreement uh, with Zumwalt over the three different cases. Oh, it's Memorandum Resolution MDC 213? Yes. Okay, so are there any questions in regards to the settlement agreement with Zumwalt Construction? And I'm directing this to the directors. I hear none. Um, is there anybody out there in the public that you see, Tori? Uh, there's one member of the public, but no questions. No questions? Okay. Uh, uh, Chair Biasteros, Tori, was, was it Myers Nave who um, negotiated the, the language? On the uh, they, they were the crafters of the language. I was the more the negotiator. Got it. Yeah, but they, they wrote it up. Got it. Yep. Thank you. So do I have a motion on the floor for to uh, approve this uh, authorize the settlement agreement? Move approval. And the second? Was that a yes? <laughs> yeah, that was me seconding the Okay, thank you. So as Director Healy made the motion and Director Wizard second. Roll call, please. Director Ballesteros. Yes. Director Booter. Yes. Director Gama. Yes. Director Goodwin. Yes. Director Healy. Yes. Director Wizard. Thank you, everybody. So now we'll go uh, any any director that would like to make comments? Um, I would just like to thank uh, everybody um, from both meetings uh, for all their hard work and Tori for all all the diligence that you've um, put forward. And um, and when you're gone, we're going to miss you. <laughs> thank you. I hope it's not too soon, but anyway. Mm -hmm. Thank you for everything. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think like some of the, you know, I had a chance to talk to Tori and some of the analysis around, um, you know, the payment standards gets pretty, pretty granular and technical. And, um, you know, I felt 
pretty fortunate that we had somebody who had that kind of expertise on hand to help us kind of lead us in the right direction there. So um, great job on that. And I think it's going to be awesome for, um, you know, participants in the voucher program here. So. Any other directors? Okay, I just wanted to say thank you, Tori, and to all the staff um, for of housing development. Also, um, that yes, that payment standards. I know it was a lot. It was a lot of work, and I appreciate that. Um, everything that all the staff or if it was yourself Tori that put in um I do wanted to ask uh Tori um in regards to the NARWA conference I wanted to suggest that maybe um Carolina can attend the NARWA conference and maybe another staff member um if you can uh, check um, what the how the budget looks for that. Um, the reason why I'm asking and recommending is because um, I feel more information in regards to resources and development in there in that area of, um, can assist them in in their job performance and you know to further their increase of knowledge. So if you can please look at that for me. Yeah, and I. So I haven't denied anyone. Uh, no one has asked to go. Um, okay. And I, I can see what they're thinking. Okay. I'll be, I'll be there. I'm speaking. Um, okay. I did reach out to Carolina this morning and asked her if she, she didn't call me. I called her and I asked her if she was interested. And uh, she said that she hadn't really thought about it. But that she would, she was going to review the NARO, um, the sessions, the different sessions they have, and then I guess she will let you know. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. So um, I think if there's no other director comments, we can dis we can close out the meeting. The time is six thirty two. Have a good night. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you.